Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, basically what has been my research over the last four years. There was a pandemic and everything. Oh, thank you. We don't have a clicker. Those are links. But then I need to figure out how to call it this. Laptop, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it works. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, basically what I have been doing at research for the last four years. Uh, the name is awful because I'm probably the worst person ever for names. Uh, hack, which stands for track side password hashing. And uh, I'm not according to the from here, or is it okay if I use the other? Uh, Johan? Yeah, you can use the other. Okay. Yeah, right, right. Okay. Exactly wrong, but this is getting very, very annoying. So uh, this is another place here, right? You can bring me one in the back. Perfect. Yeah. You know, I'm a Spanish. I have to stand up low, boys. You <laughs> So I'm going to talk about basically phone to hand the password hashing and uh, what can we do about it. I have been uh, working on this for the last four years when I started working at the cryptocurrency exchange a few years ago. Call it uh, Lescovex. We were also using other tools like uh, Ansible, that was mentioned earlier today. <laughs> so, I basically, the history starts as follows. So, all friends come to me, hey, Francisco, we need somebody to help us with uh, security at our company. And we're going to let you do anything you want to fix issues. So, what do you do then? Obviously, you sit down, try to see what's the worst possible thing that can happen at this company. And uh, well, being a cryptocurrency company, probably one of the worst things that could happen is that somebody comes in, steals all of the, our user database, gets the passwords, starts stealing the funds from our users, and let's face it, I mean, everybody reuses passwords, so most likely they try to go to other cryptocurrency changes, and they just steal the money from those other cryptocurrency changes that our users have. So then our users are not only actually at us for making them lose the money on our exchange, but also for making them lose money on all the exchanges. So what I put it. Let's see, what do we have? So we have this little password uh, authentication system on which basically we have a device, sends a username and a password. Uh, we have an IoT device because I am forced to print this as IoT for my research, but this was originally a big server. The server calculates basically the half for the SAR and the password, and then you check whether the, there is a match on the database. If there is a match, you let the user in. If there is not, you don't let the user in. The most simple, I mean, let's face it. Who here has used this before? Yeah, really has probably it most likely at least once. It's the most basic authentication system in the <laughs> Uh, the problem is the following. If we want to make a secure slow hash function, we need to use like two gigabytes of RAM for three or five seconds. And if we get, say, 52, 64 login attempts in these three or five seconds, our server will stop because we most likely will not have enough RAM at least. 2018, it was like that. I think now we can move up to one terabyte, but it's still kind of a problem. Some of these are a lot of authentication requests. So when I went to my uh, bosses, I said, hey, we can implement this very modern, very cool, I don't choose password hosting uh, mechanisms. It probably takes two gigabytes of RAM for every three seconds. They sold out, did the math and said, nope. So then I had to start and go back to the housework thing and try to think of a solution. And then I started saying, Bobby, what are the problems? So I know some password reuse. That basically means that people use the same passwords on different sites. Let's face it, who has used the same password on two or three crappy sites that they don't care if they can have? Yeah, I mean, don't, don't lie, this is the most common thing. And if you have not used the same password, you most likely have folded password name of the site or password one, password name of the other site or password two or something like that. So. If they are not the same, they are big passwords. Uh, then we also have passwords with very low entropy. I mean, probably everybody knows that the most used passwords are money, gold, and uh, law, if I remember correctly, if somebody has seen hackers from 1995. 
Uh, we have password leaks, and uh, actually there are very nice services, like I have in view, view that you can use in order to check if your password is any volume, or any other personal data. And well, thanks to the amazing world of cryptocurrencies, now we have very efficient tracking accelerators that can calculate hash functions very, very fast. So, with all of these problems, as I said, people started to sense what to do, and that's what they came up with the idea of I want to, and it seems that screen is not working. Okay, now I understand. I'm not using this thing, sorry. So, uh, this basically whole the state of the art was to, well, by the time I started my research, a little bit of further research that came afterwards, but. Uh, there was this rigorous competition. Uh, I'm not sure any of you do script over here. No? Okay, good. So in cryptography, we have this thing called a competition where basically the best minds of cryptography try, try to solve the problem. Uh, we had one, for example, for the encryption algorithms, on which we got ice. We have had one for passive algorithms, on which the SHA3 uh, uh, has a double K. And we have uh, this one called password hashing, which is a different problem because we want the hash to be slow, not fast, and to take uh, as many resources as possible so you cannot parallelize the password, the password hashing. So the problem is that the, there is this algorithm, as I mentioned, lots of memory, lots of, of bandwidth in order to access that memory, and it requires a single of CPU back. So five seconds, your CPU is at the maximum power, uh, using two gigabytes of RAM for each login attempt, that doesn't escape software, as you can figure out. Uh, it's also so that the Argon 2, as is, is hard to integrate because you have to decide around seven different parameters. I mean, any of you likes to read the documentations? Nobody does. So you start to put random values and hope it works. And the problem is that with this kind of things, it works, but it's, it's a key. So you need to be very careful with the parameters. And, uh, well, Lambda actually did a really nice survey and figured out that despite we have a lot of twist algorithms, everyone is still using separate side hashing instead of uh, you move things to the client. So they are allocating and using hardware resources on the server, which could open, for example, for a denial of service attack. And to make things worse, if you check out the solutions for moving things to the client side, there existed two of them, track station and then some lines of the Lipsodium documentation all of which are awful and have their own problems. <laughs> so, the next thing I did was like, okay, let's, now I kind of have the idea. I want to move this to the client. I have crack station and sodium, a reference of what I can do. How secure is this? So, I made a little threat model where the idea was, okay, we have this online attacker which uses logins and uh, basically tries to figure out what are the right credentials. And the only advantage it can get is if you can figure out which users exist on the system. I mean, if you, for example, know that the user is called admin, then you can try to prove to test admin with each one of the passwords you want to test, instead of trying to figure out if the user is, for example, uh, Johan Telling, as we have uh, as we have the there, or uh, Fosmoth. Or, and then if you have the more users, possible users you have, the higher number of attempts you need to do in order to find the right result. On the other hand, we have the offline attacker, where it's basically just leaks the database, so it knows the usernames. And use, use an accelerator in order to try to crack the credentials, try to make as many attempts as possible, as fast as possible, for the cheapest cost possible. And in this case, we have a problem that it's salt collisions. If two or more muscles have the same salt value, all of them can, can be cracked at the same time. And if they can be cracked at the same time, then that means that the attacker is probably going to try to attack two first, instead of the other ones where it has to try every one of them separately. We also have another issue. If you have the database and you have the password has and nothing else is done on the server side, then you just can take the value that is on the database and use it to authenticate yourself. That is what is called a password stack. So the trivial approach is this one here. We have a username, we have a SAR, we just ask the database for the username, which gives us the SAR, then we have the username and the has. And then we just send the password has that we have calculated on our device to the server, which then checks on the database if it's correct or not. And what, as it's obvious here, the issue with this one is that you can use to do a pass the has attack. There are other problems, but it's the first one that takes you mind. If I use get whatever is stored on the database and send it to the server, 
because the server is not doing any other processing of the, of the, of the hash it gets, it just accepts it because what is on the database is what will be matched level by level. Then if something went a little bit fast, uh, uh, thought a little bit more, I thought, okay, so I'm going to use a fast hash function, say SHA384, on the, on the password, uh, on the password password working. Now, because hash functions only work in one direction, if we get the value from the database, we cannot use that value to authenticate ourselves. But they still have another problem. You see that they are still sending the start based on the username. So what happens if I ask for a username that is not on the database? What happens if we change the salt after the user changed this password? Based on the changes of the salt value, we can still see if a user exists on the database or that. So we still have a user enumeration. And then grab station basically said, let's keep that part where we try to access the database to get the salt and then check one that matches the username. You state the hash of the username with the identifier of the database, password. Then you send that to the server. The server will try to figure out an extra hash, an extra salt. And it will then do again the slow hash function on the server side. And then we'll check the, uh, if it's valid or not. So aside from the fact that we have two slow hashes here, you can probably see that since the concatenation of the user and the identifier might result on two or three different uh, values, that means that you end up basically with the same sub So, after looking at all of this and spending a few days thinking about how to sort the problem, I was like, okay, I think I can just try to pick the best of all of the different walls and probably even make a good proof that this is secure. And that's what I came up with. So, we have a site identifier, a database uh, name or a domain name or a mix of both. And uh, we need to prepare the length of both the database identifier and the user. <laughs> then you put the database identifier, the username, and out of this becomes our SAT, and then our partner. We calculate the slow has, we send it to the server, and the server will also use a fast has recommended by Lipsodium in order to prevent the uh, uh, past the has. And then we just uh, say if you use a the result of the fast as function and not the database and say, yes, you can log in or no, you are not logged in. So here's a summary of uh, what is the current state of the app and the problems that we have been pointing out so far. Track restriction is vulnerable to start collisions. The sodium allows user enumeration. And I'm not sure last time I checked they still have not fixed the problem of the documentation they are providing for the duties. And uh, both Transaction and Lipsodium are missing card reference library. I mean, Lipsodium does provide an implementation of, uh, of uh, Argo2, but they don't provide a specific recommendation or a specific function that actually calculates the has if you have to pass a lot of parameters. So, with all of that of the, of the equation, the next step was like, okay, I think I have an algorithm that kind of works, but now, I mean, what do you think they will use on the cryptocurrency exchange if they want to log in? If we are lucky, they might have this amazing uh, mobile phone application. No, we did not have one. <laughs> so then the next thing is, yeah, we have this web browser application. And then if we want to implement this on the client side, we need to do this with JavaScript or WebAssembly and face all of the problems that came with basically doing things with a lot of memory and processing on the browser. So the first problem that we found is that on mobile platforms, you cannot use more than one gigabyte of memory. On desktops, it's around two. Slightly less. You also, we also found that uh, we have problems with memory fragmentation. So if you just waited too much to allocate the memory on 52 bit platforms, then it could just be no place where you could allocate the memory. So, ah, too bad. And uh, we also have problems with multi-threading, and those are still not fixed. Uh, around the time that we started with this, the uh, spectrum vulnerability was discovered, and because you can use basically a thread as a way to create a clock, pretty much every browser started uh, preventing using solid memory across the threads, which is needed in order to, to perform this kind of computation in a multi-threading. However, uh, 
if you really care your, your people, your customers or your users, you can always ask them to use JavaScript instead of WebAssembly. Then uh, the time of fasting will be like 60 seconds or something like that. Uh, one fast, a powerful one. The final issue we had was data elements. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with this, but on JavaScript, uh, strings are immutable. And pretty much any other uh, string based a type is immutable, which means that once your password is on JavaScript, you don't know how long it will last on memory. It might last a few seconds, and then you allow the allocate it. It might be there forever. So in our case, this became kind of a strength because then that meant that we did not need to clean up afterwards. Since the password might still be in memory, every other data might be in memory. As long as we use free the, the, the memory that we are using for our processing program, we just hope that the memory gets in now. So as I mentioned, uh, I've also had a lot of parameters. So obviously, when I was at the concurrency exchange, I did not even think about it, but my use was like, well, I'll use this, 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 and this parameter. So I was responsible for security. But when I left the concurrency exchange and started my PhD, and I wanted to make this into something a bit more usable, I realized that I needed to provide some security levels. So I recently found of uh, four different security levels, no more than 500 that. And then, in fact, the uh, parameters, you see that higher security levels use less iteration, but use more memory. So because they are using more memory, the total number of processing needed is higher than in other things. So the idea is that we use low. Basically, you want your system to work pretty much everywhere, and not really all phones, tablets. You use menus if you want to basically get good support of forms. And you use high if you have tablets on any level. And obviously, obviously, there is a level that is well good for people that is as far as me, which is me. So. And what I was having about all was asking this. Here you have an example. Uh, on the second column, on each one of the groups of two columns, you can see how slow in comparison to this. So in one case, you can see that the JavaScript is 123 times slower, and that the password has to more than five minutes to appear. But if you swap as everything, it was a lot better. I mean, uh, waiting 10 seconds to log in is bad, but since you can just keep the value for later, it's not that bad. And the real thing is waiting three seconds for logging is probably something that most users would be willing to accept as a security. Then we started the presentation on a seatload of devices. And so <laughs> you know, it can get me a lot with that. We may not have that many devices myself. And as you can see, low is still work at everywhere. Uh, we went to menu, some phones started failing, but they were actually very old phones. By now, they are probably seven or eight years old. And uh, with the high, we started having a little trouble with some of the tablets. Uh, especially when we were using Lip Solid. Clip of how it like a chart, probably because it does a little bit the memory beforehand, we don't have all the memory back in ISA. And, uh, well, the computer that's basically everything working, because that, that's basically the baseline, and pretty much some modern computer has at least three, four gigabytes of RAM, and uh, enough process of the game to have this. We also did that the benchmarks, and you can see more or less that. We try to keep at least at most 20 seconds as the as, as the amount of time that we could take from low for devices. Nothing as we manage to do on other target devices. And for some significantly slower than everything else, most likely because they don't have as much memory bandwidth and they have significantly slower and less performance noise. So with this, we have spent the first 20 minutes of the talk, and now I'm going to go to the real life examples. Unless, is there any questions about what I have said, said so far? Have I lost every one of you? If you are following, please raise your hand. Okay, most of the LSK is following. Good. I want to think of the middle one I'm saying. <laughs> okay, good. So, uh, the idea is that uh, on the paper I have uh, presented the uh, registration, login, password change, client side pricing, password managers, human authentication. Password not dedicated cases, or after of dedication. But uh, I need to put the cabinet of persons, this is a lot of examples. But in the real world, also, I have implementations uh, for things like uh, upon recovery, which is very similar to password chains. 
And then for things like uh, how to migrate existing databases to client site uh, password facing approaches and stuff like that. But this is probably going to be part of another paper, so I cannot talk about them publicly, but you can always call me later if you really want to use that and ask me, hey, over your code way, and I will be happy to ask for questions. So the first thing you have is this, the only example. But the first thing you do, obviously, is include uh, JavaScript that is provided by us to handle everything. Level is the security level you want to use. So remember, low, medium, high, or ultra. You intercept the forms you're missing. And uh, then you call uh, a hash function at the level that you have. So you basically provide a database identifier that could be a domain name, that could be an application name. Uh, Tell me the requisite the requirement is that this has to be global in So as long as nobody else uses the same as you, everything is good. The username, that is provided by the user, and the password. Then you provide a success standard and a failure standard. Uh, it's important that if you are providing a username, you can only calize the username. So, for example, if you are not going to check the username is uh, capital letters or small letters, you have to make sure that you use the canonical form of the username, which could be, for example, all the letters should be small letters. And the reason for that is because if the username is different, despite it should resolve the same uh, password, it will resolve on an even password because we are using the username in order to pack with the SALA button that makes this password unique. So then we send the form with the classic password and uh, that we get on the success function start. And then oh, I remember that for the server we have to pass the password again. And we can do that, for example, you see SNCA3. You could use any other function. Uh, well, yeah, actually, you can use pretty much any other hash function because the main risk you have are collisions, but not uh, that uh, the one way in a soft function is selected. That is what we are talking <laughs> okay. So you could have a new 75 that you want. But uh, as I said, the 84 will probably raise a lot less idols by putting a chain wall. Then if we go to registration, basically, we do almost the same as with login, but if we have a password policy, which I strongly recommend you have, uh, well, some people like to have them. Like, for example, you need to put uh, a capital letter, a small letter, a number, a, a, a TV character, uh, probably some all the model characters in there, and of course, an emoji, because no password can be secure without an emoji. Uh, then you verify that on the client side, because uh, otherwise you are going to ask the client to perform the consultation, choose to send the piece to the server and get a response back saying, yeah, your password is invalid, you need to wait again five seconds and the password will pass it again. Uh, you can uh, verify passwords that have been twice uh, matched uh, on the client instead of trying to hash the password two times. I mean, I know this is kind of obvious, but I, I used to work as a question that I have seen very, very badly, so I wanted to make this clear. And uh, finally, the most important thing is handling user memory. Uh, one of the most common vectors for user enumeration I have seen is that basically you use the registration form, you put some invalid data on the registration form, but you make sure that, for example, the username or the email is the one you want best. You set the registration form, quite often the application will tell you, yeah, you have all of these problems in your form, in your form that you need to fix, including this username is a valid register. So if I have my own list of usernames, I can just go like, Okay, let's see. I'm going to register as Clothing. Yeah, Clothing is not the database. I'm going to try with uh, Handle 2. No, Handle 2 is not registered here. And when I have to get a lot of the whole list, then I know it's a specific user that I need to go to my data. So that's try to use some of the possible ones. So once we have done this, we just have the password change, which is pretty much the same thing as registration. But there is a few issues that we also need to take home. Uh, we need to pass both the new and the, and the old password. If we want to verify that the old password is correct. And we need to verify the old password of the server, the mistake, <coughs> or we need to ensure that we prevent cross-site request quality. Because if our endpoint for password change is something as simple as can you set the password has to this specific endpoint. Uh, any other JavaScript function can you set its own password has and then change the password for what you send without us noticing. So that's why you usually see that they require the password 
All that we need is a unique value that can only be accessible from inside of the website. So that external JavaScript code can access the value and then in person in your website. And it's an invariable story. So, the binary, we have uh, some ideas that can make things easier when we will write in a low list. I mean, uh, first one, if you, for example, are using this on a mobile application, uh, the, you basically can generate binaries using the code that we are providing for uh, Clipa app. And I recommend you use a binary library or something like that in your application because it's always going to be faster than anything using the same. <laughs> but you can uh, basically fast change your files. So basically, the idea is the following. You make a global cache, and because everybody is probably going to use the same password always, when they try to do it again, they find that you find the password is outside of the cache, and you just provide the hash. There is only one problem. If these cards can be accessed by the other applications or other websites, whose websites can you send the request to the cache in order to see if the password is already there? And based on how long it takes to calculate the password has, figure out which is your password. We should then try to send the the server. So you need to be very careful with things like time. You need to make sure that the hash uh, is returned in more or less the same amount of time that it should take if the hash was actually on the computer on the, on the system. So that may basically reduces, as you can see, battery usage and computational requirements, but it definitely does not solve the timing problem. You also can uh, need to be careful with long-term storage because if your password hashes are stored on a uh, swap or hard drive, they are as good as the password itself. I mean, the attacker, an attacker can use pick the password hash that is stored there and send it directly, and then you will authenticate that. So, finally, you need to protect your passwords, as I said, as if they were passwords. We need to use exactly the same level of security, the same policy and handle them exactly the same. And as with any pass, you need to clean this very well. Otherwise, it will take a lot of memory and a lot of space. Then you can also go I'm not sure who put the button of the, uh, of the screen just below the button for going for the next slide. So, okay, so let's talk about password managers. Password managers, you can also store as passwords. And the idea is in the simple, I mean, when you provide the password to the password manager, you can either already provide the hash that is already calculated by the client side, or even if you have a fancy password manager, you just provide the parameters that you are using with Clipaha, and uh, let the password manager do the hash. And then, it, since the password manager handles this natively, it's going to be significantly faster and more efficient. And the only thing you need to take into account, as I said, is that has, uh, the hash of the password is the password. So you need to be as careful with it as if you could be able to play with the password. Finally, if you have one of these IoT devices, uh, IoT lab or whatever, obviously, I mean, I think like, uh, uh, yeah, that is the problem with uh, the pedic presentation so fast. So I think like this obviously does not have enough RAM for uh, calculating these kind of functions. And um, sure, you could use delegate that to the uh, manufacturer servers. And everybody knows how well that works on the manufacturer stops business, right? So, yeah, that's not kind of a good option. Or uh, you could use the wait. This thing, maybe it does not have too much RAM, but it definitely remembers things that have a few months. So, why on earth am I going to make it remember a graphic <coughs> password if I can use to make it remember a totally random string? And the name is exactly that. I mean, it's, you basically need to modify your client uh, code, which most likely you're writing yourself because these things usually do not run a browser. And then need to send the hiking copy token that you have historical piece of bugs instead of password first. And remember, from the server point of view, the password fast is the password. So the <laughs> token will be the password. So it will be equally secure as long as the high end of the token decides. You need to protect this basically with the same security as the password. That's it. Then packets are a very interesting thing. And also, if any of you have heard about them before. No. Okay, good. <laughs> so, uh, 
So as we have time, I think it's probably good that you know what is a packet, because if you are going to implement password authentication uh, mechanisms, it's a very good. Packet stands for password authenticated cake set. And the idea is that basically you pick a password and you combine it with some crypto magic, not going to go into, into the details here, so that at the end, basically the client is on the server, have the same random key. So then you can use verify that the client and the server have both the same random key and it's been doing correctly. Basically, an attacker does not learn any information about the password. And uh, they can only do one attempt at guessing the password for each time you try to perform the verification. Um, there are a few of them, like JPay, uh, MSRP, I don't know if the other report here has a for SRP. Yeah, somebody over there. Nice. <laughs> okay, so SRP basically is an example of a packet that allows basically password fashion. And it's only recommended that if you have time, you take a few minutes to read about them if you want to implement an application because they are significantly more secure than just using uh, passwords and send the password over a security channel to the server. And the idea is that you're missing one of these patterns because they take a simple a pass a password in your name. Our password has a password. We use your <laughs> password and you get both the benefits of the packet and the fact that you still require the clients to perform the computation on it in order to tell the minimum password case. With multi-factor authentication, we have a similar problem. And uh, basically, you need to provide codes with a uh, password, and you basically send them the same manner. So I'm not sure if you have any of these. Uh, yeah, there. Well, one of these cool phone applications that gives you like a 90 digit uh, code that you put when you, you try to log in. And then, so that is that you basically send it at the same time as the password has. If you need to perform any actions, you still need to be performing after verification. You should probably ask for the code once you have the password has, and the password has can take a few seconds, so that might make it change, the code change. And the most important thing is that you have to be careful. Making sure that everything runs in constant time, and then if the code is encoded, the password is encoded, and so on, to make sure that you cannot find the users that are on the very system. If you have multi factor authentication based on something like an SMS, you probably want to send the SMS after you first send the password. And then you use to that. Just verify that the password is correct, send the SMS to wait with the user for that SMS. That provides a bit less security, but well, it's better than you still in access to the use of the enemy. So, okay, I have run through my slides a lot faster than I expected. <laughs> I was expecting this to take at least uh, a few minutes more. Uh, the conclusions I have is that uh, we have to try at least the medium security level. It has, no, no, a few more things here. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you have to fast the passwords before sending them. Uh, you also should use a security channel for that. Be very careful with user enumeration because then what you do is very pointless otherwise. Uh, you should protect hazard passwords the same way as you should protect a plain text password, so you have a password that has not been hazard anyway. And you always have to fast things on the server side. So here is a demo. Uh, I will give my try it, also if I'm not pretty sure it will work on mobile phones because it's on ultra security level. And I'm going to show you the demo. I'm making sure you do it. <laughs> so now it is yes. <laughs> so as you can see, this is the typical trappy login form. It doesn't even has TLS because I couldn't get TLS to work on time on this device. It's not running on this device, but it's running on another ESP that runs on phone. This thing obviously does not have enough RAM to perform a surgical you know, like us. Uh, and there, are, there is no way, I mean, this is not communicating with another more powerful packet server, and a stick it to the last The only thing you're going to see here is one located here on the browser itself. Mm -hmm. So basically, the idea is that uh, you are blogging, there is a register form also. So let's start by the from the registration. 
The password, as everybody knows, the most secure password in the world is still Bob. That's the one they were using on the hackers' movies. They're going to open that one. And uh, then you have to enter the password one more time. Uh, oh, wait, no, sorry. That is the name of the user. Uh, Cosmos Box. And uh, I'm not sure what has happened here. Uh, ah. And then here, as you can see, the password is uh, code, three letters. And then we click on the register button. We process start the lead. And uh, as it's processing, basically, we start by working on the uh, function, the time program we see, start uh, with a folder. Yeah, that is the list that you start with. Uh, but as you can see, the user code register it, and then you can mm -hmm. number below there, and some of those time this tool for the uh, little device. Mm -hmm. So, as you can see, we can see the number of approximately five user registrations per second, something like that, because the brand of the world is being done in those by the user, that is basically the one that actually wants to register it, it helps them with the system. And uh, now that we have registered first notes, we can uh, go to the login form and see that it works in a similar way. So basically, we have the first note here. So we have the password. And uh, so you can see here on the network, we will be able to see the request going through. So basically, we get a word there. Uh, the JavaScript worker that then gets some web, web assembly code, but this uses to calculate the hash. And uh, as you can see, it basically could be here. The username is uh, the name of the user is Cosmos Rocks, that's the one that we set. So you can see that it's actually stored, that is a pretty by user. And this time, because it did not have to write anything on memory or on the database, it took exactly 0.1 seconds. So as you can see, we can probably handle 15 million items per second if one is. So I think that's almost everything I have. Uh, I'm just going to explain a little bit how this example works. So you can see a little code and see it works. But uh, do you have any questions before we move? Yes, please. Uh, so if I understand it correctly, the main idea or the main Reason why you're doing a client side is to offload the work from the server. From the server, yes. Okay. Because first, devices like that, the thing that they cannot run the server names. And then, if you have a powerful server, you still have the problem that you require to take a lot of memory for a large amount of time. So, if you get many requests at the same time, you will have a problem with that. Yeah. Okay. I do actually. The second question yes. is uh, you are trying to protect against the user enumeration. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, users currently don't really treat their login names as, as secrets, right? Yeah. So, of course, it's, it's good to not leak it, but um, so, so would, would knowing the user name greatly weaken that scheme because you use it? Oh, no, 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 no. Knowing the user name is not weaken the scheme in the sense that it will not, for example, allow an unauthorized attacker to did. Yeah. But knowing the user name, First, we make any password groups in Fabian and this year. Yeah. But that's not something related to this scheme. It's related to username and password on the case of the same. Yeah, but for the client side, hashes will be used the username and the length of the username yes. as part of the pseudo salt. I don't know yes. what you call it. Yeah, pseudo so salt equal to name. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but this is not a problem because during the equipment you have what the salt is that it's slow and unique. Okay, so as long as the application identifier is global and unique, and the user name is unique for the application, the combination of both application identifier plus user name plus the and so forth will be global. Okay. Yes. Then you uh, normalize the user names in all sorts of terms. Yes, you need to normalize the user names. But that if, if you normalize the, the user names before passing them to the SAT, you still have the, the, the issue that. Five user names might end up being the same, but this will be the same for the application. Yeah. You still get a global unique yeah. user name. 
o de cosas Ok, then last question by Bob Murillo. I see that you can follow us. So let's see a semi the politics. Uh, this is a slightly of the version of the call sector. So. Mm -hmm. You know what they say from Boston policy, but the release version is a little bit more modern. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, basically, you can see here that you have basically scripts to clean up, and violent everything. The license, hopefully, I mean, very soon the first speaker, speaker is going to tell me because this is a very open license and probably it's not going to work with all the regulators coming up. But you can see that this is basically a great and you can do with this. I mean, first thing to do with the public. If you make it commentary, I want this to look angry at you, but that's the most important thing. Here you have basically the reference tool for Armachu, so you can take that model if you need. Uh, up here you have the source code, which is basically some boilerplate code, uh, a relatively simple login program. So you can see basically it calculates, uh, allocates memory and calculates the has the system here. Uh, here. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's not much more complicated than that. It just like calculates the parameters. And there is someone going to write fixed parameters and compilation time. Has more to do with the fact that then the system gains like 50% of the performance. But the interesting quote here is here when we go to the example, and uh, basically you have all the code that you need to run this device, except that obviously uh, the password is the same one that I have home, so you might want to modify it while it's possible to this. So, if we check the code of uh, login.html, as you can see, the first thing that happens is that we include the JavaScript file. We also have this gncrest.js that I will explain a little bit what I do. And when we are going to submit a form, we basically capture the for submission using the gncrest function. And uh, for registration, as you can see, it's the same. You see? Uh, we put the screen, we have the encrypts, because we also have password policy, we don't need to be like password policy. We don't have an internal social name, so we don't need to worry about that. Yeah. And uh, basically, we use the encrypts in order to, to have them also. And um, the total of the encrypts, as you can see, is uh, very simple. Uh, we use more spinner, so the user knows that we are doing something. Because no still admits that the user fix that the uh, we use cast application, it is fine. Then uh, once we have uh, inserted the spinner, uh, we will get the, the button for submission and we will disable it because we don't want the user to use by clicking for submit a lot of times and start a lot of more cases at the same time. And uh, you can see that we are actually timing the time that it takes to put a code the has, so if we get the logos also. Yeah, I think we have done. I know because this is the best. That was the best initial time. So, but uh, basically, you can use that in order to see full performance. Uh, how password has to be like that one. And uh, then basically, we we get uh, when we are done with the password fuzzy. Basically, we get add the the creator password as one of the elements of the formula that is tied up. Uh, then we assess it, we calculate the performance, and then we just submit the form. We thought any other things, we just start taking the password. You could remove the plain text password if you want it, it's up to you. But uh, we want to make this sentence. You start taking the password and just verify the plain password. Uh, then, as you can see, uh, there is another we use to show one alert. And we just get the domain of the application, we get the login value. We get the password and we use pass the parameters to the hash function. So, domain or whatever application name you want to use, that's what you need. The user identifier, password, function that, that is called the things work, and the function that is called the examiner or something like that. Hopefully, this is easy to use for 30 months in the video. I mean, just focus on this last slide here, and then, you know, pretty much everything you need to know. Uh, domain name, username, password, mm -hmm. uh, success function, and uh, yeah. uh, Then, if we check the server code, you will see that uh, 
this, this one. It will not have many other differences. I mean, most of it is boilerplate for handling a HTTP request and providing a little HTTP server. Because we provide them, we should not have that. Please did not last time I tried to implement this. So you see here we have our router. If the path is slash or login, then it tries to show the login page. And uh, as you can see, uh, it uh, will try to upgrade the uh, hash of the function if the application uh, password is provided as one parameters. And if the password is not correct, it just shows a whole hundred of the error, otherwise it's login. And you can see, for well, example, that if it's dead or cold, we try another old password as any, and we try to login, it will uh, show an error. But uh, going back to the code here, you can see that uh, for registration is pretty much the same. Uh, we generate a random salt. We calculate the hash of the salt with the encrypted password, and then we store the value in the database. And uh, then we store the user in the user. I think that the problem is that it did not the password. Anyways, that's basically how code works. So, do you have any questions? Do you have any ten minutes to the last questions? Or the words are not being seen. Yeah, I think we'll have a question. We'll have a question. But now, I'm moving into the next one. Okay. Yeah, okay. I'm moving the hashing to the user client. How large proportion of user clients to be excluded by right? people who log in from their team or whatever. Are you mean how large of the login effort needs to be gone by the user or yeah the idea is that a lot of the effort for the login has to be done by the user and that the server has to be streamed. Maybe as you can see it's like zero point zero one from the server to balance devices. You can try to balance between one and the other but uh, if you try to balance, you need to take it for a moment that you will need to also keep in mind memory of the file as well, which could be a problem. Imagine you just try to log in at the same time. Oh, no. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. I meant if I try to roll this out at work, that have users that log in on all kinds of devices. But yes. Some uh, percentage of my users will not be able to log in. Yes. Do you know anything about how well covered the uh, web assembly runtime is in real life? Ah, do you need a runtime of this? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Actually, I didn't know all of the actions. Uh, otherwise, I would not be able to put this here. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Here. It's right. okay. You know, put this slide. Uh, Okay, you see the develop the map. You see how you set up the screen is the global one map as well. So, the highest one I followed was 90 seconds. For many, it was 31 seconds. The highest was 35 seconds. And for India, it was 34. But on average, I mean, the problem is that calculating an average here is complicated because it's a lot of different devices. Some are very old, some are very new. So, you will have to obey the both the exits. Uh, but the uh, average is probably somewhere about uh, maybe 15 seconds or 10 seconds for all mobile phones and uh, significantly less than the device of I also think you can coordinate this and the failure rates you have had with, I think Google has statistics over the capabilities of various phones and the percentages in the field and so on. You could also try to. Well, to a first version of the use to calculate the hash, but don't have to use it. And then uh, you run this on the other So you can see how many, what are the lowest times and the other is time solution for the important questions. And especially if you get any errors. So you can use that in order to decide whether, for example, maybe in this good, you know, you will have to go to work. Does that make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> Look, any other questions? The pure genius. Well, uh, I will be here uh, on the whole day, so if you want to solve this, or ask me a little bit of the password, so...
Yeah, I mean, I'm having a work on my phone. Four years of my life. No, I love that whole band now. So feel free to ask me. Okay. Thank you very much.